Even if you are a lone writer and you want to have like a consistent voice and tone across your documentation, I think it's, it's best to reach out to other people in your company, like maybe marketing or uh, product or even you know engineering, and align on on, on those things because it's it is a content strategy problem. Most technical writing and software company is about gathering lots of information from different sources. Then you know you juggle those requests, you juggle the all that information, all the data that you get. So you have to filter a lot. You have to decide what's what's valid knowledge, what's uh, less you know necessary, and then you come up with something that is gonna work with the audience you're targeting. It's being that sort of bridge that I like technical writers to be. Welcome to the API The Docs podcast. My name is Lara Wash. I'm the host uh, today, and my guest is someone who published a love letter to technical writing. And I'm very, very happy that he accepted my invitation out of the blue because we have never met, and he kindly humored me <laughs> and came as a guest. So, a uh, warmest welcome to Fabrizio Ferri Benedetti. Hi. Hi there, Lara. Thank you for, for the invite. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm very happy that you could join. How about we start with the naming reason behind your blog, Passo Uno, uh, both the language and why, why those words? Yeah, so Passo Uno, um, it, as I explained in the, uh, in the in the about section of my blog, it stands for uh, step one in Italian, because I'm Italian. Um, I was born in Italy um, 40, almost 41 uh, years ago now. <laughs> Even though I've been living in Spain since I was a kid, uh, Italian is my um, my mother tongue, and uh, to me, it's it's like a pun this name because it's also it's step one, you know, it's like the first step in a procedure, but it also means stop motion, you know, like the technique in cinema, and stop motion is like for me, it's like a way of describing sometimes the um, how we do UX writing or how we do documentation in the sense that. We go step by step, you know, and then the end result is is something that flows, a workflow, uh, a movie, if you want. What made you start vlogging? And and I understand that you don't actually start, you didn't start your career as a technical writer in software, but you have a background in psychology, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm I majored in uh, in cognitive psychology in Spain. And um, my, my, my intention was to become a researcher in academia. Um, and I entered this PhD program in, in Valencia. And, um, you know, after a year, I found out that research wasn't really my thing. And not, not because of the, you know, the science aspect, the research. I love those. And I still carry some of the knowledge, some of the learnings um, in, in my current job. Uh, like many other technical writers do. I know quite a few technical writers with a background in research. Um, it's, it's more the organizational and you know human resources management side of research that is almost non-existent in a way. Like unless you're very lucky and end up in a strong research group. Um, and even, even then it's very hard to find like an environment where you can uh, thrive uh, while being respectful of your time, of your work-life balance. So yeah, it was just you know one year of research, and then I entered the private sector uh, uh, initially as a writer for a software portal. And here we are, so many years later, with a love letter to technical writing. Yeah, that was that was a fun piece. Um, you know, it's one of those blog posts that I always wanted to write, and it's simply. It was it was unplanned, totally unplanned, and one day I, I felt like writing it, you know, and I was maybe was I was just thinking about my career, and usually the way you know this is could be interesting perhaps, but I don't have like a backlog of topics for my blog, so I don't I don't plan too much ahead like the about the topics I want to write. Um, usually, what it happens is that in, I engage in conversations in social media, for example, or uh, at work, or, um, you know, in, in the Reddit Docs um, Slack channels, the community. And um, and from, from those conversations, 
um, stem sometimes some some uh, nugget of an idea, some something that resembles like a you know a blog post. Maybe it's just a couple sentences, and then I I take it and when I have the time, I, I develop that into uh, a full post. That's how I work, and that. That love letter to technical writing was born the same way. Like it, it, there must have been some conversations, maybe in social media, about why people choose technical writing as a career, and I ended up writing that that love letter. I don't know. For me, it was very heartwarming, especially reading it back now, when uh, even the Earth is moving around ChatGPT, and and especially the conclusion that you came to that there's. I think you're quoting from some other people too that we need more people, people on the inside of documenting systems. And I, I loved reading that. that. That was a quote from, from Jeffrey Ventrella, um, who's a, a software developer from Silicon Valley. And um, I, I so agree, I so align with, with that quote in the sense that, um, you know, um, software companies need more people, people and less uh, think people. And so more humanists, more teachers, more um, psychologists even, or um, you know, literature uh, experts, writers, anything, any 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 kind of role, as I explained in another post, can bring, can lead you to uh, a technical writing position. And to me, the label technical writing is is just like a temporary way of describing someone who is bringing that mindset to tech and to tech companies. And what are the skills that? that you've been picking up recently, randomly or not randomly, initially, I don't know, prompted by others or by the, the challenges that you're facing? Well, you know, technical writers, um, we're, we're always learning on the job about new technologies. Like I'm, currently I'm digging into Kubernetes because it's, um, it's a piece of technology that we work with and um, I want to understand it better. And it's, it's quite complex, but um, it's, it's fascinating. Um, Current skills, well, um, I'm digging recently into ChatGPT quite a lot, and I'm playing around with uh, with some software that's already open source out there, and, and playing with prompts, uh, and trying to get the uh, you know this language model to to learn a bit about documentation, our documentation, and see what come out what comes out of it, and. Um, um, well, it's maybe not so much of a skill than, than curiosity. I'm very curiosity driven. Um, other skills, well, um, recently I've, I'm also very much into um, uh, continuous deployment, continuous integration, continuous deployment. So um, I've been looking a lot into Docker, uh, Docker files to, um, to containerize our, our uh, Docs code environment. So that everyone can build a doc without having to worry about uh, dependencies and and installing like Python modules and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Are you doing this learning um, alone or in a in a large team or a smaller team, or do you do like pair learning? Well, it's um, usually I um, I start alone. Like I you know I'm I usually onboard myself to stuff and and I love learning on my own. And then what happens is that um, I love to share what I learn with the with a larger group, either at work or outside. To me, the boundary there is is um, is not super defined. Like I see all writers as part of a big group, uh, whether they are working uh, with me or at another company. Like I, you know, I, uh, I maybe it's it's a bit naive as a vision, but. Uh, I think we can all share, regardless of where we are currently uh, working or writing. In this particular case, yeah, I've, I've been learning alone, and sometimes I have some um, some sidekicks and and some colleagues who also want to learn these technologies, and we maybe we create, we collaborate on some pull requests, and that's also pretty fun. Mm -hmm. Do, in your experience, um, is there aspects or or hmm, two links or tricks of specifically software documentation, technical writing, that is actually better if someone doesn't try to conquer the knowledge alone, but rather go at it in, a, in at least in pairs? Well, voice and tone um, or, you know, style guides, um, style in general is something that shouldn't be done alone, I think. So even if you're a lone writer, um, 
it's and you want to have like a consistent voice and tone across your documentation, I think it's is best to reach out to other people in your company, like maybe marketing or uh, product or even you know engineering, and align on 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 those things because it's it's a content strategy problem. So it's not really not it's not just technical writing um, skill or tip. It's a content strategy necessity to align everyone who creates content or who can contribute content uh, around things like um, how the documentation talk to the user or what terminology you use or even what, what grammar rules sometimes, you know, for things like, it can be the tiniest things like um, formatting of numbers, for example. And, and those things, they might seem like um, chores or very bureaucratic at times. Um, because you are defining these little rules that some, they're, you know, they're very easy to forget sometimes. But I think they're also a, a very nice, they provide this, this chance of getting people together to talk about content in a company. So it's it's easy to see the value of aligning around style and voice and tone. Uh, so marketing, for example, is, is one of those departments that is usually very sensitive to these things in companies. And... Um, you know, aligning around those things is is a nice excuse to get together and get to know each other. So um, definitely not something to do alone. We agreed that I'm not going to ask too much about your work because I invited you not as a team representative, but as uh, the one who wrote the blog posts. But still, let's not keep the audience hanging too much. So um, in what team do you work and what is what is your role there that you've been playing? I'm part of the Splunk documentation team. Um, we're around... F- 40 something writers, I think it's, it's a pretty big group for a tech company. Four zero. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. We okay. are in the, uh, we, you can count us in the tens. And um, in, uh, then we are splitting in, in subgroups, depending on product lines. Uh, in my particular case, I work for, uh, I work in the observability cloud docs team. Observability cloud is our, is the is, is Splunk's observability solution uh, for things like infrastructure monitoring. Uh, application monitoring, profiling, etc., and uh, and there I'm a senior staff tech writer in the team, taking care of um, the area that we call GDI or Get Data In. Um, it's a rather technical area um, where I get to document and and learn a lot about Open Telemetry, which is a um, uh, an open source software for observability, precisely. When I was asking, well, specifically in the, the meetup, the Writer Docs meetup in Amsterdam, if we would get together just randomly, uh, what would be what would be the most to the point to talk about? Now, this was before ChatGPT, but it's still it's still valid. Uh, onboarding is onboarding practices of uh, well, there's so much movement obviously lately, and also um, uh, an escalating need for more and more technical writers who are able to. Uh, orchestrate or document themselves software, which brings with it, especially in Europe, where I think we have very few uh, dedicated um, university courses for this, let alone majors. So onboarding is, or training people who are not coming from technical writing majors, is a very present need. As a staff technical writer, um, do you play part in shaping your onboarding practices and do you have some um, some wisdom to share with others here? Or don't go there stories. <laughs> it's true that in Europe, uh, there's you know very few um, courses uh, at university level and even outside. Uh, I know a few, there is one in Spain, for example, uh, that's been created like a couple years ago. The ITCQF, which is a European, Europe-based uh, international certification for technical comms. Um, so this is a very nice initiative, and we are we are seeing more and more of these in Europe, luckily. But more to your point, um, that's actually one of the things I would like to uh, dig deeper into once I have a little more time, even even maybe write something. Some, something long form about it um, to help fellow European tech communicators um, to especially lose the fear of technical writing. Um, I, I don't think 
like translators, for example. We have lots of translators in Europe for obvious reasons. And I think they're very uh, well positioned to become technical communicators. Um, they, you know, they, they know the language, uh, they know the nuances involved in translation, uh, which already gives them like a very um, hands-on, applied, almost engineering-like knowledge of language, which is very necessary in technical communication. Um, they usually, translators are not afraid of software. So it's, it's a fantastic path for becoming a tech com um, professional. Um, there are others, of course, um, but in, in general, the skills involved in becoming a technical communicator are not so complicated, or at least in my opinion, like it's it's not it's not rocket science in a way. <laughs> it's more, I think, the mindset and um, the attitude and uh, the the willingness to simplify things and and to connect. Uh, different parts of an organization to get things, um, to get content out that, that is easy to understand and useful. Um, so for me, it's more about, um, it's not as much about learning as losing the fear of entering the tech comms field in Europe and other places that it, it does not the, the Anglophone sphere. So uh, the UK or especially in the United States, um, this is a profession with, with hundreds, thousands of, of people working in, in software companies already and other, uh, you know, manufacturing companies, et cetera. It's been around for 50 years now there, but it's rather new in Europe. And, you know, I think doing, you know, making noise in social media like I do or um, writing blog posts, for example, I, every time I speak to other technical writers in Europe, I always urge them to share their thoughts, to write blog posts or even short tweets about their work. And because I think it's, it's important to just be visible. And and once you reach maybe some, a critical mass there, I think we'll see more and more initiatives, even in the training, formal training field. But it, it's taking some time. And in your under your tutelage, what is the evolution of tasks for uh, someone you're training to become a technical writer, someone who has the soft skills, has the affinity, but say, haven't even touched Kubernetes before. Where do you start? Because it is, yeah, it's very zero to a hundred. Yeah, the, um, you know, the, the technology is simply, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's something co contingent. It's, it's not essential to, um, to to onboarding someone. It could be Kubernetes. It could be virtual machines. It could be anything really. Um, it's, it's, it's it wouldn't be the focus of my onboarding process. What kind of tasks would you assign to lose that fear? This is I, I still remember this um, this on site test I did when when I started as a technical writer uh, to start working at the company. And it consisted of, um, I really I really enjoyed it. It consisted of a number of information sources, like um, there were some JIRA tickets, uh, some email threads, um, some official documentation about the tool. And then, you know, you have all this plethora of, of information sources and in no particular order with varying degrees of detail and quality. And the request was to create something for a particular audience, you know, some like some um, concise documentation to, to do a particular task um, targeting a particular audience. And I think those were, those are the, the basic ingredients, I would say, of, of most technical writing at a software company. Um, it's about uh, gathering lots of information from different sources. Um, then, you know, you juggle those requests, you juggle the, all that information, all the data that you get, so you have to filter a lot. You have to decide what's what's valid knowledge, what's uh, less you know necessary, and then you come up with something that is gonna work with with the, with the audience you're targeting. So it's it's being that sort of bridge that I like technical writers to to be. So there, there's already some retraining for translators because there, you know, you can't lose the information, and here you have to learn to filter for someone, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and what do you think is working against this kind of learning? What, why is it, apart from the staggering depth, non-ending depth of the technical knowledge that just doesn't stop going, why does technical ha writing have such a bad rap? Why do we need to blog more about it? Why is it so hard to, to get through? Yeah, such a good question. Why is the thing that other, other roles would say like, yeah, 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 nice, but I'll never do that. Never. <laughs> well, I don't think... This is, this is complex, and I think there are, there are several factors at play here. Um, but first of all, I would like to challenge the, the assumption that, um, that technical communication or technical writing is a, is a bad rap. I would rather say that they're, it, they don't have a rap at all. Like sometimes they don't, they're not on the radar, they're not visible. So there's, there's this dimension of fe having this feeling of working alone or working in a field that nobody really understands. And it doesn't really help that for, for most people on earth, especially outside of the US, um, technical writing maybe means like the dishwasher machine manual or, you know, the instructions for uh, doing maintenance for your car, which are good examples actually of technical communication, but they're not particularly um, engaging, I would say. Like um, people end up hating those, those artifacts. Um, but they, they don't stop and think like, it, that happens with translation as well. Like there's lots of care usually put into technical translation, but people don't appreciate that. They don't see all the nuances, all the difficulties that go into creating technical documentation for a consumer product, for example, and then um, translating that into, uh, into another language. And so for me, it's about building the reputation rather than changing it because it's it's almost non-existent right now that's my feeling like i would i would love to um there's this blog post that that i have in my backlog actually and uh, it will take a time to to develop but i was thinking about technical writing in popular culture <laughs> and it's we don't have many examples i think it's something you know worth researching but there's not many instances of of technical writers in pop culture like um um, you don't see a technical writer in movies, you don't see a technical writer in TV series, um, or even mentions of documentation. You know, it's not that common. It doesn't look exciting. But I think, you know, the same way we have seen doctors in TV series, um, and then we are seeing also teachers in TV series, and maybe one day we'll also see technical communicators in TV series. Why not? Oh, I hope so. Oh, I could totally see that in some Korean drama uh, about some high-tech fantasy uh, <laughs> they could bring in. There's, uh, there's some really good series where you see translators, so and they really give the backstage view to the job. And I think that does a lot for a job, to show the practical reality of doing something. Yeah, you're right. Maybe. Yeah, I, th I think so. I think so. It's uh, Well, of course, TV and movies always oversimplify things, right? But they also help uh, turn something into a popular profession or a popular um, activity. And um, even if, if those examples in popular culture don't exist, then I think we can suggest, you know, media producers or um, journalists or whoever is, is creating content for, for the masses to think about us. And I wrote this tweet a few weeks ago where I said, um, uh, heroes read the manual. <laughs> That's how I picture like, you never see a hero reading a manual in Star Wars, but pretty sure that if you, you know, if you created like an extended version, uh, you would see Han Solo reaching to the manual of the Millennium Falcon, and that would be great. Where do you see yourself evolving, if I may ask? If you factor in GPT and all the um, AI evolution happening right now, um, I see myself becoming, if, if I continue being an individual contributor in tech companies, I see myself be transitioning more and more towards uh, editing rather than writing. And I think that there's like two big, um, there's two big forces pushing, I think, everyone doing technical writing right now towards editing. One is, um, you know, starting from the most recent, one is uh, AI-assisted writing in the sense that I think 
writing as a as a as a chore, writing as something you have to do in order to achieve other goals, um, will benefit from the assistance of of big language models like GPT. And that doesn't mean will be replaced by artificial intelligence by no means. And I wrote a couple of blog posts where I say the opposite, where I say that um, if anything, AI will augment our capacities and 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 make us more productive. But there's there's room there to become like a curator of AI produced content, for example. And that will still be necessary. Like the human touch there is about um, not so much about writing like a specific tutorial, but like um, understanding where that piece of content could fit into a wider information architecture. That I think is still out of the scope of artificial intelligence. The other big push is coming from, from DevRel and, and Doxas community or Doxas ecosystem, as I recently uh, read from other authors uh, in, in social media, um, in the sense that everybody now is, is able to create or contribute content for, um, for, for, for software documentation, for example. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but for very popular products, you see lots of contributors going to GitHub and uh, you know editing um, little pieces of documentation, uh, adding topics, etc. So there also, you can have maybe a few editors at a company, and and have the hive mind or the community um, move the bulk of the content production. So, you know, the editor or the content strategies, if you want, is. It's definitely a, a position where I see myself transitioning if if those two trends continue developing and, and gaining strength. Mm -hmm. Is that also appealing to you to become more editor than writer? Yeah, I think so. I think there's especially in, in this age of information overload, there's definitely lots of value in filtering and selecting and uh, improving, enhancing raw content for for whoever is going to consume it. So um, this, I, I, I see that definitely as valuable as writing. If I, as a technical writer, feel my contribution and my empathy with the readers, then as an editor, even more so, yeah. Well, almost a year, uh, you published it last summer, if I'm not mistaken, post about on how you see uh, documentation, uh, well, API documentation, if I'm not mistaken, specifically evolving. And what kind of metrics would you recommend for each of these um, evolutionary steps? And I wanted to ask, where did this come from? Why did you feel the need to write this? And I loved reading it, and thank you for writing it. Well, um, this already, you know, as uh, was born as, as a conversation in Twitter, um, where essentially I was wondering about together with other people about um, what makes documentation complete. And, and this is something difficult to, um, to define in most cases. And the answer to me is not, there is no clear cut you know, uh, criteria for saying docs are complete when you get here. Um, because there are several levels, in my opinion, um, of docs completeness or, or docs quality. And they're all fine. And it's, you know, it's fine to just stay at one level. Um, if, well, since you were talking also about API documentation, this reminds me of restfulness, uh, you know, the restful levels in APIs. Like you, an API can be at restful level two and use resources, and maybe it doesn't have uh, hyperlinks or anything fancier than that, but it can still be a good API. And documentation might just focus on completeness and being factually correct. And perhaps it doesn't have the most exciting layout, but it's, it's also fine you know, to stay there. So I think my attempt with that blog post with the, you know, the, the hierarchy of needs for documentation, um, which was, an, again, a, a psychological pun. Uh, I think my, my psychological training always surfaces in, in, in unexpected ways like that. Um, what I was trying to do there is, is was to provide uh, several good landings for documentation. Like it's, it's just, there's no single criteria of success. You can be successful at several stages in several ways, sometimes even concurrently. And that's also, I, I also caution people in that post that um, things don't have to happen sequentially. Like 
um, maybe you're focusing on two aspects at once. You're focusing on the look and feel and the completeness of content. And um, even though, you know, look and feel is usually should be perhaps one of the last thoughts about documentation, um, at least in, you know, from my point of view. Um, so that's, you know, instead of having just one port of call, you have five. You have five places where you can say, well, I got here and I think we can consider our docs successful. And, you know, to, to each of those levels in, in that blog post, I suggested some metrics. But metrics is also still one of those aspects that is very, very tricky to, to unravel. Yeah. So the, the last season of API The Docs was about this and not necessarily theoretically, but okay, from the trenches. And we heard some interesting things. In your experience, what widely used metrics are tripping people up the most? I think we look too much at Google Analytics. It's, it's one of the few tools at our disposal. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to set up. Um, it's relatively easy to use although it can get really complicated depending on what you want to do. But the, the, the weakest side of Google Analytics is that it's been mostly designed around marketing funnels. So, you know, you want to check whether a piece of content leads to conversion, uh, like is people buying this product or is people accomplishing this action? And that's difficult to do if docs are separated from the product. So analytics makes sense when, for instance, you have in-product documentation, like you have um, maybe a wizard, um, you know, a guide, a setup guide that, um, that uh, leads you through a complicated process. And there you can measure completion, of course. Um, but if you don't have that, that sort of integration with the product, um, the meaning of page views or bounce rate or, you know, is, is very, very weak. I think it's is, yeah, it's even even counterintuitive. Like, um, it's actually good to have a high bounce rate for a tutorial because it means that people found what they needed in that page and and didn't need to go anywhere else. For example, um, and so aside from that, I think it's something that we don't do that often is qualitative research. Um, I think it's it's good to focus on quantitative metrics, of course, but before getting there. I think it is worth checking with real users uh, how your documentation is is performing. Mm -hmm. Do you have some good experiences with that? Yeah, I've been doing user research um, um, both at New Relic and Splunk in the past, and we are still doing user research at Splunk. It's you know it's a very exciting project, and um, there's so many insights you get from asking people in you know in your field um, about your documentation that you would never get um, using a quantitative tool or instrument. Um, like for example, um, I remember this case where <clears throat> we got these, these, um, this user to, uh, to open the docs and I was you know, recording the session in, and the user was sharing their screen. And I noticed that they were using a, a dark mode plugin in Chrome. And I was like, okay, this is the first time I see my documentation in dark mode. I didn't even think of trying this, but actually this is a thing. This is something that people do and you can't actually capture that in, in Google Analytics. You don't know whether they're using dark mode or not. And so that already brought a, like a, a number of ideas about improvements we could apply to, to the style guide, to the style sheet, sorry, of our site. And, uh, and then, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's all those little things people stumble upon or even just the way they scroll, observing that is fascinating. And the, the sample size doesn't need to be that big. Like it's Nielsen Group, I think estimated around five to 10 people is enough for, for a user research study. When you do such a thing, and I guess right back at your research roots, how do you scope the bite you take with your questions for a small group? Well, I, I, I try applying progressive disclosure um, to, to the process. And, and this again reminds me of, of my time as a psychologist. So, you know, you, you start from, from, uh, from exploring, you know, the maybe like a documentation set or a section and you see how user react to it. And then you provide a simple instruction, like try to accomplish this operation 
using the docs, for example. Or there was this other study where um, I created a Docker container with the tool that we document uh, so that the, um, the users could run it and try to configure it using our documentation. So the task was simple. And then after they tried to accomplish the task, there were a number of questions about um, how was your experience or uh, where did you stumble upon or you know what, what sort of difficulties you encountered. Um, so it's about digging progressively deeper but starting from something very simple because users start also from something that is apparently deceivingly simple, like I want to do X. But then, you know, they land on the documentation and they discover that it's not that simple. Exactly. <laughs> what are the things that you experience that you need to work towards in a roundabout way? Uh, there's an expression for that that avoids me right now. Things that you can never reach directly. So as a technical writer, uh, most of the things are quite straightforward to reach unless it's about getting the subject matter expert to engage with you long enough. But... Are there targets that you answer for that cannot be reached directly, but you have to go around? It depends on the, you know, on, on the company setup, on how your organization works. But in general, I think in, in software, um, there are a number of things that are difficult to reach, are not impossible to reach, but they're difficult to reach for technical writers. Um, one of them is um, testing certain scenarios. And that's, um, like I always recommend that technical writers um, test software themselves. And it's, it's a fantastic way of <clears throat> onboarding yourself to a new technology. So if you have an API, you know, ask for an API token and, you know, set up Postman, try some calls, etc. cetera. Um, but other more complex scenarios might require uh, like spinning an entire cluster of servers and, you know, trying to configure that is is usually out of reach for technical and, and budgetary reasons. So uh, there you have to necessarily rely on secondhand knowledge. Um, other things that are difficult to reach are, you know, like um, other areas of the business might be producing content that might not be entirely aligned with what you're doing. And, you know, and usually those areas do not, do not use docs as code, like you have maybe to use Adobe Experience Manager or similar content management systems that are pretty closed. And <clears throat> there is about, you know, uh, trying to establish, set up good relations within the company with, with those content creators. But this, again, is, is a content strategy problem. It's not just a technical writing problem. You have to, you know, um, create those alliances with other people who create content so that the flow for the user is seamless. Um, unfortunately, it's not always the case, but you know, you, you can't just change all the content. It would be fantastic if you could change all the content with us, you know, uh, by just by snapping your fingers, like, oh, I want to change the UI text and the marketing material and the documentation and even the code comments, you know, in one sweep, but that takes time. But that's also usually um, um, what has the most impact. As, as, as a technical writer, it's one of the things that that you can do that have the most impact. As a closure, we usually ask our guests, what are the advice or message in a nutshell you would want to leave the listeners with? But you have shared so much advice. Uh, let me turn this around for you. What is the question you would like to leave the listeners to sit with? So it's, it's two questions, really. Um, there's two questions I would like to ask um, the listeners and, and really anyone who works in our field. And the first is, why do you want to be a technical writer? And, you know, in, in, in many cases, we end up in this field by chance. It, it happened to me also. Um, but I think that even after having worked for years as a technical writer, um, many of us, you know, never formulate that question and, and try to answer that question. And I think it's important to go over it and, and try to come up with an answer that, that is good for you. You know, um, it provides purpose and it provides direction. And I think that's that's very helpful to have. And the second question, well, it's more of an advice really, rather than a question. I think the, the other piece of advice is, especially when we talk about developer portals, 
is don't panic. Don't. Yeah, it's, I think it's, it's very, very easy, especially in developer documentation to, to fall into the trap of the imposter syndrome. Because we, most of us are not developers or have very limited experience as developers, but we are writing for them and we're writing, you know, developer content and it's very easy to, to think we are not doing a good job. But you have to think this, just by trying, you're already improving things. And I think that's the mantra that, that should guide us when creating developer portals and developer documentation. Wholeheartedly oh, agreeing with that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Fabricio, uh, for being our guest. And I'm looking forward to meeting you in person, uh, wherever that will happen. Likewise. And this was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. And looking forward to your blog posts in the future. Will do. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. We thank our colleagues at Pronovis Developer Portals for letting us work on this and the entire API community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest that you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website, api.docs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API.docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well. <laughs>